Welcome, my listener friend. You're listening to these midlife adventurers on CosmicBroadcasting.com, brought to you courtesy of the good folks at Qualtech Manufacturing and Blue Star Recyclers. I'm your host, Chris Hardy, the short chick with the walking stick. You can find out more about my other motivational messaging endeavors at shortchick.com. Do you struggle to find meaning in the difficult challenges of your life? Our guest today offers encouragement to do just that. His own life is a testament of transforming challenges into being a positive force in the world. My guest is Wayne Connell of Invisible Disabilities Association. Find a ball online at invisibledisabilities.org. Wayne, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to talk with me today. Oh, my pleasure, Chris. Cool. Thank you. Um, you know, Wayne, uh, you have a fascinating story to share with us today and just an, an amazing way that you turned um, a really difficult situation for both you and your wife into something really positive that makes a big difference in the world for other people. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got to be there, who you are um, personally, professionally, and what you do with Invisible Disabilities. No, I only get, what, like 15 minutes, right? Do, how long do we get to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, no. we got time. <laughs> okay, good. But, yeah, good, it good. could be a while. So, um, <laughs> hey, um, so, you know, bo- born and raised in beautiful Colorado, and I have to say I'm a native, and that's a great thing in Colorado if you're yes. fr- fr- from out here in Colorado. So just a wonderful thing growing up in the, the view of the mountains uh, every day. It's amazing, amazing time. But, um you know, life was, uh, growing up was, was uh, an adventure. Um, you know, a lot of crazy stuff of divorces and alcoholic stepfathers and, and really, uh, tough times in life, but a lot of amazing times as well. And, um, so when I, uh, graduated from college, um, uh, Colorado Christian University and got a TV and radio broadcasting degree in computer information systems and so kind of love the real technical world and I was also working at uh, a radio shack at the time and uh, my first store I managed outside of college this gorgeous blonde gal walks into my store and I was totally smitten <laughs> and uh, her name was Sherry and I was, mm-hmm. I was telling one of my coworkers there and I was like wow I gotta get to know that girl Holy smoke! She uh, seems to be amazing, and and um, had an opportunity to uh, go to a singles group uh, at our church after yeah, after a few weeks and spend some time with her, and uh, you know, kind of you know, fell in love with her. And and one of the interesting things she uh, shared with me one of the uh, first nights that we were out on a big kind of a big group date with everybody, and she shared that uh, the year before, back in 1991, so this was in '92 when when we met, um, she uh, had been diagnosed with primary progressive multiple sclerosis. And if you understand MS at all, it, that's the MS with no good days. It's basically, at the age of 27, she was permanently disabled, unable to work anymore. Um, you know, just just day-to-day functioning was a, was a difficult thing. But you wouldn't know by looking at her. You wouldn't have any idea. Mm-hmm. She shared that with me, and that's the same year we, uh, she was also diagnosed with Lyme disease. And um, from a tick bite, we can trace that back to when she was 14 years old and, uh, and been bitten. And um, she was in pain from head to toe because of that. But I was, you know, I was just, like I said, smitten before. And just, I mean, she was funny. She was, uh, you know, uh, she'd been an actress and a model. And and I always uh, thought it was fun when she did beauty pageants, when the girls would be um, doing for their special performance, you know, violin or some ballet routine or some classical piano. Sherry would be over doing musical comedy theater songs and having the whole place laughing and rolling. And, and that's just the kind of gal she is. And, you know, you wouldn't know by looking at her there was anything going on. She, um, uh, you know, she just was a, just an incredible trooper. And so we got married in 94. And um, so I signed up for this interesting life. <laughs> and, of course, we nobody knows how difficult it's going to be when you, uh, when you bring chronic illness into a, into a relationship. And in 1996, she coined the phrase invisible disabilities because people would look at her, Chris, and, you know, we go park in disabled parking and you get out and she looked 10 years younger than she was and and uh, they would scream at you and yell at you and say, you can't park there, you know, you're not disabled, there's nothing wrong with you, you're not in a wheelchair. And in reality, is uh, just walking from the car to the, the store was, a, you know, was, a, was an adventure and a difficult thing. Um, and so... Uh, 
she had written some little pamphlets, you know, one on obviously on disabled parking was one of them. <laughs> and she wrote on some MS and multiple sclerosis. And I said, you know, why don't we put these things up on the Internet in 1997 and let's tell the friends and family about it. You and know, that, was that way if somebody asked. Internet. Uh, it, it was It's new. pretty cutting edge. Yeah. You know, it's fun, funny as we've got, we've got shots of the original website. It's pretty funny. <laughs> you, can, you can go on the Internet and you can what's called way back and you can actually go way back and you can look at some of these websites and you go, wow, boy, we've come a long ways. Like <laughs> you know, and so, um, uh, all of a sudden we had 20, 25,000 people a month come to the site and say, and you know, you put into words what I've been trying to tell my friend and family member. You know, mm-hmm. the difficulties we're going through when it's invisible, when the symptoms of an illness are invisible, you know, people don't believe people, and that's a sad thing. And um, so, you know, the organization continued to grow. We wrote a book, um, But You'll Look Good, and I'm, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that some more later. And yeah. uh, since mm-hmm. that time, I think we've sent almost 27,000 copies around the world. Wow. And it's just been incredible. And and um, they're really teaching people the language of invisible disabilities. And, and the organization continues to grow um, till, till this day. And, um, you know, you, you go through these difficult times as a kid and growing up, and you, you kind of, you know, everybody's got that big why question, you know, why, why, why. And I think the really question is, it's what. You know, what am I supposed to do with what I've gone through? Oh, you know, yeah. how can I help somebody else that's going through it too? And I think that... Uh, um, it's turning that corner is a, is a difficult thing, but when you do that, it's, you know, that's why we go through, I believe, a lot of things is because you can say, hey, been there, done that, and, and, and you're not alone. So that's Absolutely. kind of the short version. That is the short version. Oh, there's so much to your story, but that is, uh, that's a good intro to who you are and what, uh, what Ida, Ida Invisible Disabilities Association is about, um, and why you do what you do. You've, you and Sherry have made just a huge difference around the globe for people with invisible disabilities. Uh, and Wayne, why don't you, why don't you tell us a little bit more about what is a dis, what is an invisible disability? Um, what kinds of things does that cover? And, and who does it apply to? Well, I would say the first thing it doesn't cover necessarily is something that is manifested itself invisibly. I mean, that sounds, sounds so simple, but, but really what it is is the invisible symptoms of an illness. So there are obviously a lot of illnesses, things like fibromyalgia and PTSD and diabetes and um, just, you know, I could probably, uh, you know, chronic fatigue. There's a lot of illnesses that you can't see on the outside, and those absolutely would be invisible. But what if you're in a wheelchair, and, um, you know, wheelchairs don't necessarily limit people. In fact, assistive devices like canes and wheelchairs, and you think about glasses, you think about, you know, hearing aids, you think about prosthetics. Those things are designed to help that person function like they, you know, had uh, when they had a leg or, or when they, you know, um, you know, when they were able to walk. And, and in Colorado, it's funny, I mean, you can you can – Join a wheelchair basketball league. You can um, go skiing up at you know up in the mountains if you're in a wheelchair, right? They have yep. they have certain things you can adapt. Um, you see, I see people. You know, they run Ironmans with their prosthetic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's cool. just amazing, right? Amazing. So those assistive devices allow them to do something. But what happens if that person also has chronic pain? Right? Or what if they're dealing with PTSD? Or, you know, or what if they have diabetes? Or what if they have some illness that you can't see on the outside? It's those invisible symptoms that people, um, they don't believe. And it's just a sad thing, you know. I don't think people are trying to be mean. They just, you know, they're kind of incredulous about it. They're like, yeah, well, I saw you do this one time, so don't, I don't believe you. When in reality, we don't know that that person, that may have been the only time they could do it, or... We don't know what it took for them to be able to go to an event or, or be involved in a situation or, or make dinner or whatever it is. You know, we don't know all the things that go on behind the scenes. And so, um, you know, I really love what one of our board members um, said. And actually, you would know this, this young lady, Allie Garrett, who's yes. been a longtime uh, champion Allie. of uh, in, of invisible disabilities in a children's hospital nurse for many, many years now. Yes. She's within a great organization called Roundup River Ranch. Yeah, um, amazing. But... She she just really nailed this on the head the other day. She said, this is what Ida is about. We believe in the invisible. And I went, oh, my goodness. That's, a, that's exactly what it's about. Yeah. We believe in the invisible because so many people feel like nobody believes them. Yeah. 
Yes. And that's what uh, Invisible Disabilities is about. It's about believing people. And it's, it may be about believing the person in a wheelchair who says, I can do this thing. It's not just about I can't. It's I can do this. Mm, and and we point. may say, well, you look like you, we may say you look like you can't, you know, um, because you're, you know, you, you know, yeah. But we don't have the right to tell somebody that. It's up to them to let us know if they can or can't do something. We can't just do it by what we see, but we do. It's it's yeah. oh, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words. Or seeing is believing, but we all know with a <laughs> with Photoshop and everything else, seeing is not believing anymore. So we need to really believe the person, not what we see. Yeah, that's so true. Yeah, it kind of does go against um, our culture these days, doesn't it? We're uh, we're so guarded and suspicious of, like you said, um, photos and photoshopping and all of that. It probably does bring, um, you know roll on into the rest of our lives and our relationships and we have to just believe the person when they're saying well today i can do that to tomorrow i might not be able to and you know right. vice versa that's huge isn't absolutely it? and does right, that because, go oh ahead. go ahead go ahead well it, it is it is um you know we don't know if somebody you know let's use the example like for, uh, if somebody's chronically ill and they you know, you haven't seen them in church for like a year, right? And they show up one day. And then b- people's first reaction is, oh, you must be doing better. But the reality is maybe they just said, you know, I'm going to put up with all the pain and the suffering, and I'm going to go to this event and be with people that I want to be with that I haven't been with, and I know I'm going to pay for this for the next three weeks. Yes. But our first assumption is, oh, they must be doing great. And so that's what we tell them, oh, you must be doing great. Well, it puts them in a weird, awkward position, you know, versus saying, wow, I can't believe you made it here. Yeah. You know, man, I am honored that you came to my birthday party because I know how difficult it's going to be. Now, what's funny is, is what I'm saying is means that you know what they're going through, right? But how do you know what somebody's going through, Chris? You have to ask them, right? Because yeah. we don't know. I mean, I can't. Yeah. But if you're going to ask them, what's the first thing you got to do before you can ask them? You can't ask the person on the street, right? You can't go, hey, what's your disability? You know, why? <laughs> you know, it's interesting, a guy, a guy on his Facebook the other day put, oh, those people that walk so slow in crosswalks, I wish there would be a trap door and they would get a ticket for walking so slow. Mm. And, of course, I put on there, how do you know they don't have an invisible disability? And it's like, uh-huh. and then what was really interesting, his daughter chimes up and says, just like me. <laughs> and I went, oh, my goodness, you know, <laughs> I didn't know that. But, uh oh. But but how do you ask somebody? You earn the right, right? You earn the right by being their friend, okay? You know, you want to be their friend. You know, it kind of even ties into the issue of where people think, man, I don't want to talk to them. All they talk about is their illness. All they're doing is complaining and blah, blah. You know, we hear that a lot, right? And, and we're like, well, I don't want anybody just grumbling about that. Part of the issue is is nobody's become their friend, nobody's listened to them, nobody's validated them, and then once you get an opportunity to do that, they don't want to talk about their illness anymore. They want to talk about, you know, of course, out of here in, in Colorado, we want to talk about Peyton Manning, right? <laughs> or we want to talk about, uh, you know, or we want to talk about American Idol, or we want to talk about, you know, what's going on in the news or the weather or those things. They don't want to talk about their illness, but the reason why they talk about it so much is nobody's listening. And if somebody would say, wow, I can't believe what you're going through, then we can move on. Yeah. Oh, it's so true. Sometimes you just we just need that validation just to say, hey, right. you know, um, I recognize you and I know something's different about you. Uh, you know, let's let's have coffee. <laughs> uh, so, right. You know, Absolutely. Just start a relationship. Um, it doesn't have to be invasive, but, you know, get to understand the other person and where they're coming from. Um. And I know, boy, it it can play out in so many different ways and at home and um, in families and also in the workplace, too. That has its own own issues. Uh, what, um, what have you found in the realm of the workplace with invisible disabilities and how that plays out between employer and employee? Well, you know, obviously in the workplace, you know, you've got legal ramifications on, you know, American Disabilities Act, and you've got things called the reasonable accommodations and, and times where what they can ask and can't ask. But I will tell you that one thing is, is in order for them to make any kind of accommodations, the employer has to know what a person is going through. You know, they have to, that, you know, that's a legal thing. They can't accommodate somebody if they don't know what they're going through. And, but that's always a difficult thing, right? So if, yeah. you know, if they're, 
because they feel like, well, if, but if I share that this is an issue, are they going to look down on me? Are they going to, uh-huh. you know, treat me differently? And in some cases, they do, and and that's where Invisible Disabilities is really good about providing literature and and information on our website and our book and those things to kind of help people understand that better. But I, you know, I'll give you an example. I knew, I knew, uh, you know, at a company that I had worked at. You know, where they had um, a husband and wife who, who, you know, were working at the same company, and, and uh, the wife, it was very difficult for her in the morning. Sometimes people with chronic illnesses, you know, it's kind of like a two- to three-hour thing to get everything started. And, to, you know, sometimes it's taking the vitamins or medicines at the right time on an empty stomach, not on an empty stomach. I mean, I mean, the whole world is just, you know, crazy. And so mornings are very difficult. So for her husband to be there... And to take and to drive her in was a great thing. You know, they'd go in together. Well, the company wanted to change his hours to a different set of hours. Okay, so the thing about it is, is that his boss needs to know about his wife's illness because, in order for that reasonable accommodation, it also reaches into the spouse. By the way, so the accommodation yes. covers both. And so, but they needed to let them know that that here's the reason why this isn't going to work. The other thing I would say is, in some cases, as a business owner, you know, if somebody's a business owner, sometimes making a simple accommodation of having that person come in at 9 versus 8.30 makes a huge world of difference. True. You know, I, I know I know a lady that she comes in at noon and works till like 8 o'clock and mm. very productive. But coming in in the morning, not going to happen. You know, but now we have somebody who's being very productive who couldn't be if they were at this other time. So it's... It's it's that it's still that asking, but of course, obviously, you got to be very careful in the workplace of how you ask and who asks and those kind of things. So true, so true. Well, there's a lot more to cover, and we will in a moment, uh, my listener friend. If you have an invisible disability or know someone who does, or maybe you even live with someone who does, um, we're going to talk about the helps available through invisible disabilities in just a moment. That's next. You, my listener friend, are listening to these midlife adventurers with Chris Hardy, the short chick with the walking stick on CosmicBroadcasting.com. How do you turn life's biggest challenges into something helpful and hopeful, not only for you, but for the world? Our guest today has done exactly that. Wayne Connell founded a 501c3 nonprofit organization called Invisible Disabilities Association, and it's findable online at invisibledisabilities.org. Wayne, we were talking about um, a lot about what uh, an invisible disability is, how that might play out um, at work, at home, and a lot of our listeners are going to be um, looking for some information, I suspect, as far as uh, what you might have available to help them or to help the people they love or maybe even their employer. What, um, uh, where can they find more information from Invisible Disabilities? Well, of course, obviously, you know, like you mentioned, the website, InvisibleDisabilities.org. And, um, you know, we have a bunch of pamphlets on there that you can actually, you know, do a single print of uh, everything from uh, disabled uh, parking to um, service animals to, um, uh, but you'll look, uh, but they look so good to, looks can be deceiving. There's a whole bunch of different pamphlets on there. So that's a great resource. And those are, those are all orderable on the website as well. And we have people a lot of times that order them. You know, a stack of 25, and they give them to their friends and family. Uh, I know a lady that was laid off from work because of her illness, and um, her uh, she sent these she sent a uh, sent these out to to everybody at work, and and her work actually contacted her and said, you know, we're so sorry, we didn't understand what you're going through, and they sent her flowers. Of course, she was unable to do the job anymore just because of her illness, but they actually got it, and it really kind of mm-hmm. changed that relationship, and that was a great thing. Um, and I would say one of the, you know, we've got lots of great videos and video um, of people's journeys. Um, and then the But You Look Good book, which is probably our, you know, kind of our centerpiece of the organization. And uh, that book, which helps people learn the language of invisible disabilities, you know, it's just a tremendous help. And people do buy those for, for their whole family and their friends. And, and um, I've heard many a husband that's ended up on their pillow until they read it. <laughs> So it, well, um, and you've, you've also shared some stories in the past about how it's helped save some marriages along the way as well. Uh, it's incredible. You know, we had a lady in uh, New Zealand whose husband read it straight away and brought her tea and biscuits in bed the next morning. Wow. You know, um, you know we've heard of husbands on their knees uh, asking their wife for forgiveness. We've heard of, you know, moms of adult daughters whose husbands, the husband left, took the kids and everything because thought the mom was just faking it and making it up and 
and the uh, her mom read the book and uh, said, "Ah, oh, you know, I'm treating my daughter this poorly as well," and and um, created, you know, was able to help restore that relationship. You know, the sad thing is, is we get, uh, you know, so many stories of the, of the opposite of the, you know, of where people have been devastated, and so we want to be able to to kind of speak into their lives and. Um, you know, another way we do it is uh, we have an honors banquet coming up um, in October. We ha- do it every year in October, which is a National Disability Awareness Month. And we do honors awards. And this is a way we can give back as well is to really show uh, other organizations and people that are making a difference uh, um, for people with disabilities around the nation. Wow. Um, yeah, and it is quite quite an event. I've had the, the pleasure of um, attending several of the banquets. I used to actually be on the board of, of IDA, of Invisible Disabilities Association. It's a great organization. The banquet is something to go to. Um, there's amazing people there. Great friendships are made. Um, great partnerships. Um, and uh, it's, it's so helpful, and it's just a, a, a great feel-good event you'll walk away um just amazed at boy at all the people around you in that room and um how people keep going even through pretty tough situations uh who and it is an honors banquet um wayne tell us more about that part of it who is it honoring so this year so this year it's on october 24th which is uh you know coming up soon and um uh, this and the theme this year is called "It's Not an Illusion," which is just great because people think that their illnesses, at least, are you know, other yeah. people think their illnesses are an illusion. Yeah. And so we actually have a our, our uh, special uh, entertainment for the evening is an illusionist couple, cool. and we're thrilled. They're you know, and we hope that what they're going to do is make some things up here instead of disappear. Right? We're going to they're going to be <laughs> what we call invisible no more. Yes. Um, but this year's uh, recipients are just, I mean, incredible. Um, you know, we a corporate award. So these are people that are making a difference. The corporate award goes to somebody who's their company's making a difference, and uh, it's going to Dave Leninger, who's the founder and chair of Remax. And uh, Remax is mm-hmm. uh, does a lot of amazing things with um, the Children's Miracle Network, uh, the Susan G. Uh, Susan B. Komen Foundation, um, and the individual uh, agents are just doing a lot of things in the disability space. Um, the Founders Award is the award that is given every year that actually is for the impact of the on the organization and the founder. And that's a gentleman named Paul Myhill who founded an organization called Traffic Jam. And what they do is rescue children from childhood slavery and trafficking. And a lot of those children are dealing with trauma and disabilities and, and you know, PTSD and a lot of those things from the trauma they've been involved in. Wow. Um, our Impact Award, which is always we want to honor another nonprofit who's making a difference. You know, we, you know, we, we want to partner with organizations. And so that's going to a Kimberly McCleary, who is the former um, president and CEO of the Chronic Fatigue uh, Immune Deficiency, or CFIDS Association of America. Our Inspiration Award, and, and it's okay, Chris, don't get too excited, <laughs> but it's going to Kevin, Kevin Sorbo, who was Hercules. And Andromeda, and the author of a great book called True Strength, which just came out a couple of years ago, and he talks about when he had three strokes while he was shooting Hercules. Wow! And it's just a, an amazing, fascinating story. So he, he's getting our inspiration award, our Invisible Hero Award. Um, we really want to focus uh, on invisible heroes, uh, those men and women in uniform who uh, come back and uh, um, they become invisible because of their illnesses that that are invisible, like PTSD and traumatic brain injury. And that's going to a lady named Jennifer Brewstar, who is the uh, co-founder of the Tug McGraw Foundation. And if you're any kind of baseball fan from years ago, Tug McGraw was, uh, I guess, an amazing baseball player. A um, little bit before my time, but the, he uh, passed away of a um, brain tumor. And so they're doing some amazing stuff with a project called the Invisible Brain Injury Project um, and helping those uh, military heroes um, through therapy. Uh, the Perseverance Award is to Laura Hillenbrand, and um, a lot of people know that name, and some people don't. But she is the author of Sea Biscuit and Unbroken, two oh. incredible wow. New York Times bestselling books. In fact, Unbroken is still on the New York Times bestseller list. And I think it's up to almost, uh, I think it's pushing two years on the New York Times bestselling list, and they're putting together a movie with Angelina Jolie as the director. I mean, it's going to be well. crazy. But she. She lives daily with um, chronic fatigue, and um, you can really see the, so for perseverance, for her to write these books, which are full of difficulty and passion and suffering, and 
you know, I mean, we all, most people have seen Seabiscuit. You know, take that down broken, which is a real uh, a gentleman who survived the concentration camps in Japan and and being shipwrecked. I mean, being his plane going down for forty eight days out on the ocean, and oh, the story is incredible. And he's still here. It's amazing. Wow. And her writings really show um, living with an illness comes through in her writing and how she gets it. And it's very vivid in in her writings. So that's our Perseverance Award. Our Research Award is going to John Kelly, who's the chairman and CEO of Cirascan, and they're a brain imaging company in Denver who is a partner with the Tuck McGraw Foundation on the um, Invisible Brain Injury Project. And uh, they're doing some incredible mm-hmm. stuff with how they can map the brain. I think they're up to something like 40 different areas of the things they've been able to map in the brain, um, from PTSD and traumatic brain injury to all kinds of other different uh, uh, brain injury things. Incredible stuff. And then our final one this year for our awards is going to our volunteer award. It's going to Sherry McDonald Galbraith, who founded the Saddle Up Foundation in, in Denver that uh, does a lot of amazing things with animal therapy for uh, for uh, people with disabilities. And so, uh, you know, and every year these awards just are just incredible. And like you said, what, you know, the, the acceptance speeches and, I mean, oh, my goodness. And, you know, uh, I mean, I just think of uh, somebody else who got a Perseverance Award one year, you know, on the phone. Uh, <laughs> Me too. Who's online. Or, yeah, well, you know. You know? <laughs> I was very and, honored, uh, very honored to get I, that award. You know, it's, it's, what was funny is, is last year the lady who got the Perseverance Award, um, uh, she uh, had been in, in a climbing accident 27 years before and fell 130 feet and broke her bones in 150 some places. And yeah. but you wouldn't know by looking at her. No. And um, I, I just love her line. She goes, "I didn't know I could get honored for being a train wreck," is what she said. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, that's an interesting way to put it because really these are not awards that you like win. They're yeah. actually because of your perseverance. Yeah. And I know that, uh, Chris, I know your journey has been an amazing story of perseverance, and uh, mm-hmm. it's, it's just been incredible. And so that's what we try to do is to really to honor these people. To It's fun. It's entertainment. And it's it's our big fundraiser each year. And, and yeah. we even have ways where if you can't attend the banquet, you know, you can, uh, you can actually um, join kind of a virtual um, uh, banquet online in a sense, a virtual fundraiser to help to help us reach out and provide this literature and, and the, the great website, and which, uh, I don't know if you know, so we recently updated, and it's, uh, I think it's great, and all the video stuff that we do. Yeah, boy, the the website invisibledisabilities.org, it's, uh, it's just a treasure trove of information. Uh, really uh, fascinating and informative. Um, definitely take a look, and uh, you'll you could spend a whole lot of time on it, so uh, you might we need to so. pick and choose. Yeah, but we'd love for you to, to spend a lot of time. There's a lot of great information there. Uh, Wayne, you had also mentioned briefly about Invisible, uh, Invisible Disabilities Day, and I understand that there's been a proclamation issued in Colorado for the same day as the banquet. Right, absolutely. You know, this year, uh, this is our first official Invisible Disabilities Day, which will be October 24th, and the uh, um, the governor of uh, Colorado signed that as a proclamation. And, uh, you know, we look forward to taking this uh, beyond Colorado this year to uh, take it nationwide. And, and uh, you know, I can even see us moving to a uh, Invisible Disabilities Week or even an Invisible Disabilities Month and because 80% of the people that uh, have an illness um, don't use an assistive device. Wow, eighty so, um, percent—that's huge. Yeah, so you wouldn't, so you wouldn't know, right? Right. Um, and, and some of those use an assistive device only because um, you know, on very limited basis, like a scooter or sometimes a cane or those things. But on a regular basis, you wouldn't notice. And so, um, yeah. you know, there's this, a large uh, portion of the population out there that, that are dealing with disabilities. And so, uh, and like I said, it impacts. It doesn't matter if you if you have visible signs of your illness or not, right? It's it, it's, but it's it's those invisible symptoms that that chronic pain, that fatigue, that um, you know that technical term I love to use, brain fog, yes. where a lot of people have brain fog because if your brain's trying to figure out how to you know keep the body going, sometimes the thinking part gets put in the back, you know, um, the memory, the thinking, those kind of things. So, and that's a, you know a real a real symptom, and so those are the things that that actually limit people. 
Yeah, absolutely. And and sometimes an invisible disability, it's not always um, physical. It can go more to uh, more to the uh, a mental or mind condition too, can't it? Right. Yeah. The you know it's or, or I like a, what somebody put it what he called a brain disease in a sense. But you absolutely, it's it's not just on the physical part of the body, but it's you know it, it's interesting. We uh, we wrote a blog. Uh, we write regularly for disability.gov. And um, which is down right now, which is interesting, <laughs> but um, that's another yes, subject. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> But uh, mm-hmm. um, it, the name of the blog, and this was our, we actually got the most social media traffic blog last year on their website, because, this one blog, and it's called, it, it's, it's, um, it's All in Your Head was the theme, right? <laughs> because people always say that, right? Yeah. It's just all in your head. When a reality is, think of how many different illnesses, everything from, from uh, autism to PTSD to um, uh, seizure disorders to, you know, I mean, you name it, uh, you know, a bipolar, all those are in your head. <laughs> Right. That's true. So, so the reality is, is but that's not what people are saying when they mean no, that. We know that. Right, we exactly. want to help people. <laughs> we want to help people to to not say those things. Right. Yeah. That's what we're trying to train them to not say those things because we want them yeah. to learn things that are encouraging, not things that are discouraging. Yeah. Um, so, so when people say, "Oh, I'm tired too," right? It's like. Wow, yeah, if you that's only a tough knew. one. <laughs> right, because you're t- they're tired. Is you know, hey, I took the kids to school this morning, and then we all went to went to play afterwards, and they did all these fun things, and that's why they're tired. Yeah. But when you have somebody who has fatigue that is so overwhelming that they can't even sleep, I mean, I've heard that because people are like, well, at least you can sleep, but but some fatigue is so you can't even sleep, you can't shut anything down, and then it becomes worse. You know, that's. When somebody who is ill says, I'm exhausted, you know, oh. that's different than I'm exhausted because I had so, all this fun today, right? So it's mm-hmm. learning those things of just helping people. And that's what we want to do is help people believe. Yeah, absolutely. It is. It's all about believing and um, trusting the person next to you, even though they might look perfectly fine. Uh, right. Believe in them when they say that, yeah, it's, it's just not a good day. Absolutely, right. physically, or or what have you. Yeah, so important, so important. So Wayne, it has to be just really fulfilling to to be able to change so many lives and relationships in the world. How? Uh, what sense of fulfillment do you get from working with with Ida and helping so many people? Uh, I know you put in crazy long hours every day, day in, day out, um, but obviously it must be worth the effort. Well, you know, it is. I mean, the reality is, is yeah, I, I mean, I do. I have a full-time gig during the day, and then I run Ida full-time every other waking moment I can. And, yeah. and you don't do that kind of stuff. You don't do, you know, that kind of time because... Um, out of obligation. It's really out of passion. It's out of the passion yes. that you you see. Gl- two things happen: is you see glimpses of the people who find out that you exist, and their lives are like, oh my goodness, I'm not alone anymore. Mm-hmm. And you see that yes. change, and they're like, man, you know. I mean, I know. You know. I mean, I know of people who you know have have lost loved ones due to to due to suicide, and they're like. I wish I would have known about you. Maybe they wouldn't have felt alone, you know? Yeah. Not that it may have changed what happened, but, you know, it's that aloneness. And so there's that huge satisfaction of seeing that happen. And to sit next down to somebody and talk with them, and they go, you are the first person that has understood me in years. And that mm-hmm. break it. Now, the opposite of that is, is it the things that break my heart? It's like, what happened to everybody else understanding them, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. so that passion on that side is the passion of the injustice, right? The passion of every single day. You know, sometimes I wonder, I'm like, wow, there's so much work put into this. And, and you know, is this worth it sometimes? <laughs> you know, you just think yeah. about those. And then you think, of, and then somebody says something. And they're not trying to be mean, but it comes across really hurtful to somebody with an illness. And you think, yep, there's one more reason why we exist, you know. And every day somebody proves my point that we have to exist. You know, we have to exist. We have a mandate that we have to be out there encouraging and educating and connecting people touched by illness, pain, and disability. It's it's. I have I have to do it. I, I you know even though sometimes 
we're exhausted. My wife and I are just exhausted. You know, it's exhausting and being around difficult things. Yeah. And but you have to, you know, and so that's where I think the fulfillment comes, and then the passion drives um, just enjoying it. I mean, I just love seeing people. The light bulbs come on. The you know, we were talking about this in our board meeting just recently about you know what is the one thing that people who become invisible have to deal with, and it's the isolation, right? Yes. And so, yes. how do you overcome that isolation when somebody cares? cares enough to call somebody, cares enough to just say, I, I'm thinking about it, cares enough to say, I believe you, and you watch that change. Because, you know, we all know what happens when that isolation continues and that doesn't happen. It turns into despair, despondency, and sometimes even into suicide. And, you know, and we don't want that. People have value, right? People... You know, we think about the whole issue of productivity. I mean, you hear this thing, oh, you know, they're not being a productive member of society. I'll tell you what, when somebody's ill and they're not, they're not able to be productive, they're the ones that are frustrated. They wish they could work. They don't want to sit at home. You know, they're not sitting at home. They're trying to get well. They want to be productive. But it, even though they're not productive, if you spend 15 minutes with somebody who's been in chronic pain for 30 years, your life will be transformed. They're incredible. They're incredible project managers. They're incredible. Their perseverance is amazing. And so those things, it's like, that's what's incredible. They didn't run an Ironman. They got out of bed that day. But you know what? Yes. If I was in that kind of pain, Chris, I would be flat out on my back, whimpering and whining about everything. <laughs> I mean, I do that when I get a cold, right? I mean, let alone have to deal with bone-crushing pain day in, day out, that no medicine touches, that nothing touches. And then the isolation that comes with it, because people don't know what to do, so they don't do anything. Well, I'm here to say, Chris, it's the little things you do. It's the call. It's the let me bring you lunch once a month. It's I'm already going to the store. Can I pick you something up? Those things are more impactful than, you know, having to transform their lives and find the cure for them. They don't want that. What they want is relationship and friendship. Well said. Yeah, absolutely. Wow, you hit on, on a lot of really great info there and um, ways that we can all make a difference in, in small ways that we just don't always even consider. And as far as you keeping going too, Wayne, um, this is a passion of yours. I think that comes across, obviously. And um, I've seen you work, and you do just keep going and going and going because you have a passion about this. If you don't mind sharing, though, uh, fill us in a little bit on how the role of faith maybe helps you keep going personally and or professionally. Well, you know, it, it is my faith. It's, it's, it's my faith in the sense of that I have a mandate to take care of the least of these um, and the people that are, that are struggling. It's also the faith that, that knows, uh, you know, um, because of my faith, I know that people have value. I believe that people are made in the image of God, and if they are, they're worth something. You know, we don't, they aren't to be discarded. They aren't to be, you know, left out there and, and to become invisible. I mean, it's, it's, it's our responsibility to reach out to them. And it's our responsibility to take what the, the, comfort, the comfort that has been given us by God to give that comfort to others. We're supposed to do uh-huh. that. You know, yes. you go through difficult things because other people need help going through that same difficult thing. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. you, you hear, you think about it, you hear about the marriage counselor that's been divorced five times. You think, oh, my goodness, what, how are they? But you know what? Guess what? They've been there. <laughs> they True. understand the difficulties in life. And they, you know, and they're like, oh, my goodness, you know, it's in that crucible that you learn. You know, it's, you know, I love this verse in Romans 5, 3 that says, rejoice, rejoice in suffering. You're thinking, really? Why would I want to do that? Because suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And that character is what we need in t- today's society. We need people, men and women of character, because they're the ones that step up and help others. And that produces that hope for those people. And you only get there by enduring through suffering, right? You don't get there by the microwave shortcut, I don't want to do that. It's all about, you know, i got to have the fountain of youth, drink it, shoot it up, do whatever, because I'm going to shortcut this whole thing and get to that character. And you don't get there that way. No. You only get there, 
you know, we talk about that with gold. The only way you get the purest gold is to light it up until it melts, and you take that little dross that's on top, and you skim it off. And you keep skimming it off, and so it's that fire that continues to make it better and better and better. And so that's what I love in my life is that's happening. You know, I don't. I walk around sometimes, Chris, and go, "Do I have kick me on my back? Is that really happening? <laughs> Seriously, one more thing." But then I think, you know what? But that's another person I can relate to that I can can reach in their lives and say, you know what? I I may not be able to understand it, but I got some idea what you're going through. And I want you to know that I care about you. Mm. So that's how faith really plays. You know, I, I think that uh, um, it's it is it's the thing that keeps you going, knowing that that there you what you're going through can help somebody else. I mean, it really becomes the it's not about me thing in some sense, right? It's not. Yeah. It's about how can we impact others to help them just make it through the day and be a friend. And show them what I call love. I mean, love in action. Really, it's it's doing something for somebody else. Not even be not because they deserve it or anything. It's because who they are. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I I agree with all of that. So much so. Do you think you hit my passion button, Chris? Yeah, I think I think maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got a pretty good feel for that. Oh man. <laughs> You give me and all of us much to think about. I can't believe we only have a few more minutes here left. But uh, briefly, I'm curious, Wayne, do you see yourself as creating a legacy? And do you believe anyone can intentionally create a legacy to make the world a better place while we're here and continuing on after the fact? Well, you know, what's interesting about that is we don't have children and, um, uh, you know, if we had had more time to to to, uh, to we we have kids which are actually our goats. <laughs> you have yes, you have other literal literal kids. Yes, yes, we have literal kids, right? <laughs> but 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 the legacy for my, me is, for example, is invisible disabilities, and that's really a legacy. And I think that everybody can have an impact by what they do, and um, and it. And they can have an impact through their job and through their work and through their hobbies and through their relationships. And I think that uh, I think we need to be intentional about that some too. You know, it, it takes work, right? It, it takes work to impact somebody else for the better. But I think that if we're actually all willing to do that, um, yeah, we're going to have an amazing world. I mean, you know, it's back to that character issue I was just talking about a little bit yeah. ago. That character produces that. The character says, "I got to do this no matter what because right is right, and I got to do what's right." You know, and um, I mean, it's just like the word integrity. It's doing what's right when nobody's looking, you know. Yes. I mean, the reality is that's what we need to do is is do things and, and, and take the time to do it. It is really, really worth it. it uh, it's Then it doesn't become work. It becomes your passion. It becomes easy. It becomes fulfilling. Yes. Um, and so you're, you're a I role think, model. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, well... <laughs> We're going to run out of time if I keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> we could go for a whole other hour, Wayne. I know. I, I, I know, love I listening to you because you do have such a Thank passion, you. and it just um, uh, it's infectious, and it makes anyone who's around you want to want to do better as well, and um, and make more of a difference as well. So, well, I wow. want to say something about that, Chris. Too. I can't do this all on my own, and we need help. So we need volunteers. We need people to support the organization, you know, all those things. And so, um, you know, we need to find other people of passion as well to come alongside our organization because, you know, been doing a lot of it by myself for a long time, and uh, it's it's you know we've created this amazing uh, organization, but we need people to also come along Absolute. and help support. Absolutely, and that's actually my last question for you too, Wayne. How um, if people uh, would like to talk with you about how they can help you, or maybe to get more information about how Ida can help them as well, or about ways to partner? What's the best way for them to reach you? Well, probably the best way is just through the website, uh, invisibledisclosed.org, and, and there is a contact on there, and you can uh, just uh, send us an email through there. And we get emails on all kinds of different things. Um, we, uh, being an all-volunteer organization, don't have a phone number, really, that's out for the public. And the reason why is um, we don't have somebody who can answer it every day. And so, we, But through the email, we can, you know, we can get the get, get get the word to the right person and and um you know we lo- i love speaking you know i can speak for groups and and um uh obviously do radio stuff and uh, you know any of that kind of thing so we 
you know, we're, we're always up for that kind of stuff, too. And so that's a way to really get a hold of us through InvisibleDisabilities.org. And join our Facebook, you know, get on the Twitter feed, um, and that will also keep you up to date because we're constantly keeping that stuff posted as well. Absolutely. Yeah, you're all, all over the place online. I love that. Well, Wayne, thank you so much for being with me today. I know you're super busy. Uh, thanks for taking the time, and good luck with your banquet uh, later this month. And it's just been a pleasure. Uh, you inspire me to keep going as well. Thank you, so Chris. thank you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome.